Hello. Um, I think the most important part of the title is from artist to software developer and back. And I noticed today the biggest difference between artists and coders is that they don't know how to handle a mic. So don't do it like this. <laughs> I think it's, like, it's an ice cream. Yeah. So from artist to software developer and back, um, actually, I have been a musician my whole life, and I am a software developer for only two and a half years. Um, as a child, I played flute and cello. I was into contemporary classical music as a teenager. And then I went to university to study Latin and Greek literature and linguistics. And I opened up to other music genres, um, more pop things, uh, trip hop, drum and bass. Uh, I started to play jazz music myself, I switched to the double bass. Um, after my PhD I went to study jazz double bass at the music conservatory. And I ended up um, with this band called Amatorsky. Um, we played in the pop, dreamy, melancholic stuff, as you might tell from the picture. Um, yeah, and at that time I uh, had a growing interest in the internet and how you could promote uh, music on the internet. Um, how you, it was like the time that everything was changing with social media and stuff like that. I actually had a startup ID around that about dealing with social media as a musician or an artist. And that's how I uh, got into my first steps of software coding. Um, and a bit later I also started to ask questions about how the internet could uh, change um, how we make music, not only how we promote it, but really how it could change our artistic process and make it less static, more uh, interactive and dynamic. So in 2013, um, we made this website, deletingborders.com, um, which was actually a song of us, um, but with a step sequencer built into it, so you could make your own uh, version of it, and it had also quite a nice visual aspect to it. So it wasn't coded by me, it was coded by other people. Um, but yeah, we came up with, with the concept. And then, three years ago, I was here in Berlin at uh, Loop by Ableton, and Norbert Schnell was one of the people speaking over there about um, interactive music in, for the mobile web. There were, were also quite a lot of talks about live coding. And at this event, like um, uh, things came together in my head, because I was thinking about switching my career into software development and web development, and at Loop, I understood, of course, I also can make music with that and, and uh, uh, use those both things at the same time. So about three, four months later, I moved to Switzerland. I'm from Belgium. Um, uh, and uh, I started at an e-commerce company as a Ruby on Rails developer. Um, and since about one year, I have more time to make music, and I have uh, my a new project called Roski. Um, uh, it's a solo project, and at the beginning of the year, I said I want to make a web audio album. Um, like the idea is that um, the whole language of indie pop translated into something interactive in the browser using web audio. Um, so, how do I get started with that, with um, creating a web audio album? Um, the thing is, when I sketch musical ideas, I don't want to worry about closing brackets. So a text editor, it's not a good context for me to make music from a start. Um, I would rather do that with some instrument or with a DAW, like Ableton in my case. That's where most IDs start for me. And then the next question is, how do I get from this, this DAW to web audio? 
So I looked into uh, the Tone JS library, which is a great library from a musician's point of view, um, because it has this more musical concepts like measures and bars and parts and loops. It has a transport timeline um, to sync everything up. So I looked into that and then I decided to make a Ruby wrapper around it because I'm actually a Ruby on Rails developer and I only know one language. No, that's not true, but I'm not that good for JavaScript. Um, and it's not really important, the language thing. It's more like syntactic sugar. Um, it, I do get rid of a lot of brackets that are like that. Um, but uh, it actually slowed down my process because I have to translate everything from JavaScript to Ruby and back. But it was an interesting thing to do. And um, I also learned a lot about Ruby. So let's try a demo. Um, I'm uh, not going to live code, but I'm taking the risk to live compose but I have a backup plan. So um, this is live. Um, I already have a beat prepared. OK. And now I like to work um, with uh, samples um, in a drum rack. This is actually quite small right now because of the beamer. So uh, let's stop that. It's annoying. Um, oh, no. Lost of this. So I just dropped these samples over here. Uh, it will be easier without microphone. And, uh, It's not a big hit, but it's okay for two minutes. So I'm going to save this, and now I have to get this into my Rails project. So I have to come to copy this into here. I have Ableton folder. Okay, and now this is quite empty. Oh. Now let's go to the code I have for this. So 
actually, I want to use this Ableton information in the browser in Web Audio. And um, so I have like a, an Ableton object where I just refer to this file that I copied. Um, and then I make instruments uh, out of that because the Able Ableton file knows how many MIDI tracks it has. And I say, OK, I want to build a sample for my beats. And they are uh, in this folder. Uh, I forgot to show that because um, you also have to copy your WAV files, of course, but I already did that before. Um, and the same thing with the vocal samples. And then I connect everything to the master. And then in this line of code, I can say, OK, build me a session for those instruments, beats, and samples. And then I have parts, tracks, and scenes. Maybe I should uh, mix that. Where, where is it? So parts are, are these things, and tracks are, of course, these the vertical things, beats. And, and in the horizontal lines, they call that scenes in Ableton. So yeah, I do that. And then I have to get everything to the browser. Um, and that's what I do on the next line. And here, I create some interface thing. And now, let's hope it works. So this is like a very stripped down version of my Ableton file. I have the beat over here, and then I can start everything. Second scene. So that's it's quite <laughs> Thank you. So only eight, eight lines of code, I think, to get my, my uh, Ableton stuff into the browser. But if that's actually not interesting to replicate Ableton in the browser. So I, I deliberately did it that way with a very ugly interface because I don't want to do that. It's, it gets interesting if you can get interactive with it. And that's like what I did in, in the, on the second page. Um, scroll, like I checked actually the same thing, but then I added these three lines, and what it says is like, yeah, check for the eye in the scroll, and if it's more than 500 pixels, start the first session, and start the second session if it's more than 2,000 pixels. Yeah, let's go that. So, reload. Start scrolling and uh, some nice visual input. Oh, no. it should start. Started. I hope you can tell it was the second scene. Um, good. Um, or. Let's say I don't like the samples I, I had from Ableton. I want to use um, other samples. That's what I do over here in this other drums thing. Actually, I build a, I don't take it from Ableton. I build an, a new sample, and they are with samples in, those, in this folder. Well, these, you know what I mean, these URLs. So this is actually the same thing, but with other drums. I like the duck. Sorry, I don't have a stop button, so I have to reload. <laughs> um, and the last thing I want to show is, yeah, we can also add some effects to it. So what I do over here, uh, we start with the same thing, but then I put a distortion between the beats and the master, and I put a delay between the samples and the master. That's the same thing. And then I made some class to listen for I and wax in uh, I and X not wax um, 
in the browser and what this actually does. If, if you reach 150, then the Y position is controlling the delay feedback divided by 500. So I'll reload. So I start with this button. Source.com, it's a beat. So I'm scrolling down. this this chrome thing so yeah it's quite clear i think um two minutes left that's good um so let's wrap up um, what i try to do is like build bridges between a mus musicians and a coders workflow so i i hope i did that in the last 10 minutes uh, doing some music and some coding um, because I think that would be an interesting thing for the web audio development to to do, to build bridges between more natural environments like a, a, a DAW um, um, and coding and also make it more accessible. What I like about Ruby thing, it's I, I think I can show it to my fellow musicians. I didn't do it yet, but and they will probably uh, more or less understand what it does. Um, because I hope that we can make this uh, web audio thing really into new music form and get beyond the promotion gimmick. That's what I saw until yet, like a Flume did something with TonJS, but it's like an afterthought and not really musical process. Maybe I'm, I'm overlooking a lot of great things, but well, yeah, I think more from the, from the pop music perspective, it's still the case. So I hope I also to get a music audience on, on board and not only the tech audience. So, I know I wasn't, I will not have time to discuss this, so I'll just let you read it. You can ask a question about that if you want. And this is where it is it's really a test uh, repository. Um, you can break it in two minutes, I think. Um, I hoped I had music ready at this event, but it's not really the case that I have my first song. But um, I made up a landing page on my website, roskicom uh, slash WAC. Uh, to sign up for my to my newsletter if you want to hear new music and you can email me of course thanks thank you very much Hilko we have a couple of questions that have come in on slack um, so someone was asking about the XML file that is output from Ableton and if there's any extra information in there that you could use to do interesting things with particularly the paths of where the samples are on disk and that kind of thing. There is, a, there is a lot of information in this XML file and it's, 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 it just took me a little time just to read it because like a simple file like this, it's like 10,000 lines or something. Um, yeah, there is a lot of more things to get out of it, sure. And there's a question about, you were showing some Ruby code there, Ruby on Rails code. How do you do the communication between Ruby and JavaScript? Um, quite ugly, actually. I, I, I put all the JavaScript into a string, and then this string goes into the browser. But it works. <laughs> and the final question that's come in here is whether or not you're recording the web audio, the files that you create, or recording the browser output. Is that an artifact that you're generating as part of your music making? Um, not really. Well, the, the idea is that it's not fixed, that it's like a, a never-ending thing. Um, so, actually, I'm against recording it because that's how we re need to rethink, I think. But I will do it because I, wa I want to read an audience, so I'll have to make a radio edit and uh, put it on Spotify <laughs> and SoundCloud. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Thank you very much. You're welcome. Thanks.